So I'm, I'm a representative of the American Brachytherapy Society. I have, a, in my whole career, I've worked very closely with urologists and multidisciplinary care of prostate cancer patients. And, um, you know, we're, you know, we're, a, we're a great combination, brachytherapists and urologists. In, in fact, you know, you were the, you brought us the technology that we, that we push forward. Um, and we're kind of neglected by our own radiation oncology colleagues for a number of reasons, and you kind of touched on it a little bit. But, um, you know, uh, hopefully I can make a cogent conversation of where we're at and where we're going. Um, you know, historically with brachytherapy, um, we, we are a whole gland treatment. And I think bringing up focal therapy right now is really a great interest of mine. But I'll, I'll tell you where we've been. And this goes back to just retrospective data. I think we're, we all know about comparative effectiveness data, but whether it's HDR as brachytherapy, SEEDS as brachytherapy alone, SEEDS as a boost therapy, HDR as a boost therapy, the long-term data really su suggests superiority over especially our external beam approaches of the past. And you can argue that there's probably a 20 to 30% PSA control rate that's missed when you just do external beam radiation. And in our community, um, I'll get back to it, but there's, there's a, an, an issue with that within our own community. Um, we know that brachytherapy and surgery compare very similarly for whole gland treatments. Um, if you look at a surgical endpoint, a PSA of 0.2 as a cutoff, we know now, this is from Juanita's Crook data on thousands of men treated with 15 years of follow-up that if we obtain, obtain this PSA nadir of 0.2, like the surgical endpoint, guys re, at four years, guys remain free of disease at 15 years, pretty assuredly. Um, this is LDR data, but it applies to HDR as well. And this is, is not what we're getting out of our beam. Um, we have, um, data, we know that brachytherapy has value as well. I can show you many series of level one evidence, level two evidence, retrospective data on comparative effectiveness, looking at multiple endpoints. Um, but, you know, it's easy to see how brachytherapy brings value, brings quality adjusted life year value, um, brings economic value um, at this juncture in 2020. And we have something called level one evidence, which you know my field in particular has chose to ignore on a, on, a, on a large level. I don't know if you know these studies and I'm not, I was, when I originally thought of this this morning, I was gonna dive deeper into this. I don't think it's necessary, but all these, these studies here are what we've, what we are taught in medical school is what changes healthcare and, and should drive standards of care 0232 establishes brachytherapy alone for intermediate risk prostate cancer as better than combined therapy with less technology or less uh, toxicity, much less costs and efficiency, but it's largely ignored. Ascend RT, I'll show you just data on this real quickly, but this is a randomized controlled trial done in Canada. Now with 12 years medium follow-up showing superiority, uh, superiority of a brachytherapy boost versus IMRT, modern IMRT alone. The, the PSA differences are profound with just mild toxicity changes that can be mitigated, though largely ignored by my community right now. 0321 is 10 year median HDR data, a, a phase two data from almost 20 institutions so that we can really grasp what we're doing with HDR as far as efficacy and toxicity. Um, 0526, hopefully you'll hear more about this year. This was a phase two multi-institutional data on salvage for uh, radio recurrent disease. Um, this was an LDR study, but multi-institutionally, everything's been embargoed for too long now, but um, I think you'll be very uh, interested and happy with these results. It's kind of whole gland, kind of partial gland therapy. An important publication from this year is from Hoffman, just looking at comparative effectiveness, comparative functional quality of life between multiple modalities of treatment, surgery, beam, SBRT, brachytherapy, the addition of hormonal therapy, just looking at as far as validated quality of life um, outcomes are. So we have all this, and I would say it's all in the favor of brachytherapy, but um, 
we have some issues. And so let me just start off by just showing you the Ascend RT data. Um, in their publication, as they looked at a surgical endpoint of a PSA of 0.2 as success, if you look out at seven years, the, or let's just say nine years, the ability of a prostate brachytherapy boost to um, it, uh, um, what it obtains as an 80 to 90% PSA control rate in, these, um, in this population versus a 20% control rate with beam alone, that difference is profound there. And, you know, the comment is PSA doesn't matter, but we all know it, it does. And it depends on the population you treat and your patient expectations, your practice expectations. But this, this difference is, is huge, but, um, you know, it has changed very little to change standards of care in the United States um, within my own field. Um, so despite that big difference, so 85% PSA control rate at 10 years versus 40%, in high, mostly high-risk guys, ignored largely because of a little bit higher GU toxicity rate, a couple of incidents of obstruction and stricture that lead to, you know, in my practice, I'll get two or three second opinion referrals a week where I'll see a radiation oncologist comment in their discussion that they acknowledge the Ascend RT data. However, they're prescribing nine weeks of radiation because of the stricture rate associated with brachytherapy. And um, this is, an, a, you know, the toxicity report from the Canadians is wonderful. It is so very thorough. It breaks up actuarial incidences and prevalence, and it's been overinterpreted. And, uh, and I'll show you real modern data. You know, this isn't in experienced hands, and this isn't a big deal. Um, you know, for the PSA benefit. So the HD, LDR, HDR, all the same. There's more similarities and there are differences. This is 10-year median data from 129 prospectively treated patients with unfavorable and intermediate risk and high-risk disease. Key points here is the local control rate is 98% at 10 years. You cannot achieve this with external beam radiation. In fact, in the same population, in prospective trials out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and others where they've done biopsies at two years, you're getting about a 30 to 40% positive biopsy rate with beam alone in this population versus a less than 5% rate if you're doing kind of maximal pelvic therapy for these people with high burden disease. And if you look at toxicity here, you know, so in this prospective study of 14 institutions with a median of 10 year follow up, basically you had a 1% risk of proctitis, 1% stricture, 1% incontinence, a couple incidents of obstruction, all, all mitigated by the time of this report, in fact. So we are doing this in a better way, and I'm going to show you even how to do it better. Um, so brachytherapy has issues, and there's also trends in radiation oncology that have to be discussed. I mean, randomized controlled trials today support better outcomes with brachytherapy. I can, I can argue that with level one evidence. But and if we really look honestly at our external beam success, really we're not doing better than five sessions today. However, the most common prescription in the United States is between 39 and 45 sessions of either protons or external beam. So despite a, a, a abundant evidence, we have not gone to shorter courses, whether it's brachytherapy or SBRT um, in, in, in national trends, though the data is there. Reiki therapy is one to two sessions. It's cost effective. It confers value, better quality of life. There's so there's level one data to support everything I have here. And my experience is because of my practice at, in academics and private, patients, euros, PCPs understand this, but our radon community largely ignores it. Um, within our our the power, you know, it, no one really cares. We've we've we haven't effectively been teaching it. We've lost volume at universities. We've lost our, our skill points. So we've made too much about, you know, mild side effects that we can improve upon. Um, brachytherapy does, can have more side effects. That's what people say and, and can quote. It is onerous, it is time consuming, it loses revenue. But, you know, the really thing that's driving practice in the United States, not outside, I mean, can, um, for instance, I can go into other guidelines that have changed and um, have pointed to brachytherapy as been standard of care. 
But IMRT as the even revenue as revenue is the key endpoint in radiation oncology in the United States. It's driven everything for 20 years, and that's allowed us to kind of become, you know, as part of the American Brachytherapy Society, we pre were preaching to our, you know, our choir, you know, we are believers, but outside of it, we haven't really changed things within radiation oncology, though I, I do believe urologists and patients get it. Most prostate experts, if we go to our steering committees for energy and stuff like that, they don't practice brachytherapy. In fact, they are not high volume providers. Very few are in multidisciplinary clinics. So they, they're not like me who sees a guy at age 40 with prostate cancer that has helped that guy decide on surgery you know, throughout my entire career. They're more likely to see 75 year olds that probably don't need to be treated. So they don't deal with recurrences and side effects and the, you know, the devastation of hormones like a, a higher volume multidisciplinary radiation ecologist would. And I'm a part of the energy steering committee and, and our interest is not in brachytherapy. It's in new indications for SBRT, new indications in you know, androgen receptor antagonist or whatever you, you wanna to bring to the table. And we're, we're very heavily invested in post-operative radiotherapy, which is a good thing to be invested in, but we're not going in any novel way of the themes I think about, which is better selection, genetics, better imaging, focal therapy, you know, and external beam is not without issues. It's a boilerplate approach. I mean, they're given, you know, three years of hormones to anybody with Gleason 7 disease and beyond if you follow just standard guidelines in NCCN, which is, is just really um, remarkable in 2020. The model is changing, so we're going to have to, you know, wake up and feel the effects of two months of radiotherapy versus five days versus one day and see if that's really going to sustain our departments going forward. SBRT is not for everyone. I think everybody knows this. To do SBRT in the right way um, takes a lot of time and effort. I'm only one of five centers of all Colorado that are accredited to do it well. I see people all the time with terrible pelvic discomfort because of um, SBRT misses. And I, I, I do see a lot of radio resistant disease. However, if you do it right, you shouldn't have that. And there's a lot of more hyperbole than hypocrisy, but that's my field. Brachytherapy quality has improved over time. I, I would say that our early implants were blind. Our patient selection was poor. Our outcomes were acceptable. But you know, if you take a population of providers, you know, we have more side effects than external beam. But if you take a, a, a population of well-trained brachytherapists, you actually you have less side effects, less radiation exposure, and that's where we need to go. So uh, Dr. Crawford, you know, to this group, hopefully I haven't gone too long, but really the future is less toxicity through MRI-based LDR and HDR, including focal therapy. You know, the time is right for that. And we're, we're really a great link. If, if a patient isn't going towards a focal ablative therapy or surgery, you know, brachytherapists are the partner with urologists to combine you know, the, the fusion biopsy, the MRI and ultrasound learned information into a cogent treatment plan that is in an individualized care to the patient is going to reduce side effects. And I think ABS has a big job in messaging. We got to get our, we got to stop just teaching, you know, preaching to our, our believers and, and get out the message and, and really shake up the rat on world a little bit with the data we have and, and try to be not ignored any longer. We have a bunch of training initiatives like Dr. Crawford, um, it, it, just because we, we, we're, we can't do things in the past, today in the past, like um, 20 years ago with Seattle Prostate Institute, we have this 310 initiative where, where we're trying to um, train 300 brachytherapists in 10 years to become competent providers in the United States. In the fall was one of several workshops we've done through the years, but we had 100 attendees, 30 urologists, 30 teams, of radiation oncologists, physicists, and urologists that learn modern brachytherapy, which has trained, changed dramatically and evolved dramatically, and we can teach anybody to do it. It's highly efficient, and it's very individualized, and it's, it's very elegant. I, I very much enjoy it, a part of my practice. And then we, we can help drive multiple avenues of innovation through selection, genetics, imaging, MR-directed, everything. It's focal, it's focal therapy on one end of the spectrum. It's treating stage four disease on the other end of the spectrum. You know, really brachy is indicated for all stages and events of prostate cancer. And we just have to 
um, it, it, in some ways it can be the best thing to offer and that's what we have to really take advantage of. So um, in doing all this, I believe great things will happen. So now what is modern brachytherapy? It's, it's, a, it's a huge integration of imaging into imaging software, fusion software and treatment planning. But this for instance is a MRI directed ultrasound guided biopsy. So planned on an MRI, translated in the OR to real time seed placement, updated every second with where the seeds actually um, end up to know before you leave the OR that you have an ideal implant that's safe to the bladder and rectum, everything's in the right place. This is modern prostate brachytherapy. This is a seed technique that I can teach anybody um, and I'll, sh I'll show you a, a workflow plot real quickly. This is modern HDR. This is a case I did last week. This guy had a wild looking prostate. This is space or right here. This is the rectum. This was the prostate. And this is a urethra as it cruises up to the bladder. You know, and this is, I want to just point out a key thing here. Um, these are my, my uh, catheters in place with an MR marker. So we do direct MR planning on these patients. So we don't have to fuse, no fuse uncertainty. I can circuit, circle a little. Um, there was a region at risk over here. I didn't bring that in. That was biopsy, it had um, group five in it, um, that sort of thing. But this is at the apex here. We all know this as the GU diaphragm, very little prostate there, but there's a very large external urethra sphincter there within the bulbar urethra and into the prostatic urethra that needs to be protected. And this is what we're able to do both with MR seeds, MR directed HDR. You can see where CT just falls way short, ultrasound just falls way short if you're trying to achieve this. And MR is really, uh, the, it's the basis of my modern technique today that I can lend into mapping um, biopsy, targeted therapy. I can go back to the same spot a hundred times if I need to, um, to, to hit a region at risk. So last, last slide, and thank you for your time today. On the left here, it just shows you if we integrate MR into our workflow for HDR or for LDR seeds, it doesn't change the workflow. You just have to, you have to do what surgeons do. You put a team together and you you go after it and you, you walk it out and you practice and you regroup and you say, how we can do, how can we do this better? It's just like a robot for bladder cancer where, you know, the times and efficiency just comes down and down as you do more and more, you know, and the key is to know your anatomy and we don't have these side effects of stricture and obstruction. Um, on the right here, just want to focus on this for a section. Um, Stephen Frank, who provided me a couple slides here just from a past like this is his here and this is his here. Um, and I have probably about a thousand patients treated between LDR and HDR in the literature, prospective, single institution. You don't wanna make a lot out of it, but we don't see strictures or frank obstruction at the rate of 4% or 8%. In my, in my career, it's been one in 200 patients, about a half percent have needed cystoscopy for major urethra intervention. It usually comes down to dilation um, is the solution, or maybe we can't help the person, but we're not talking about um, something that is a, is a grade four toxicity requiring surgery. And whether it's LDR, HDR, yes, we have irritative symptoms, but they return to normal and, and the curves kind of come back to normal using a modern technique in particular. And I think through education and messaging and through these, you know, this novel intervention, our relationship with urologists to bring this to the forefront, I think that we can Im improve upon what we've done in the past dramatically with less toxicity, but also more individualized care, like the conversation about focal therapy based on mapping, fusion, and ultrasound. I think all that stuff really matters, and that's where the ABS is vision, and that's where our time is going to be going forward. Thank you, Dave.